this, you know, that I, does again, not make I, any of it okay. Yeah, no, but I just say there's some. <laughs> Nathan, form... do not, do not die on this hill. <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to say for what I know Paul was maybe trying to say. Um, well, it's not like we're going to be talking to Paul for much. Longer, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mr. Demille, I'm ready for my close-up. Are you not entertained? I Supposed to blow the bloody doors off. Well, good movies. Hello and welcome to Well Good Movies, the podcast that asks which movies are well worth watching and which deserve to be remembered for all time. I'm your host, David Osger, and I'm joined by my co-host, Craig. Get off that table. It's Craig McDonald. Jesus, you make me sound like a cat. <laughs> Everybody wants to be a cat. They, they really <laughs> Actually. There's been a lot of cat talk recently, so that is very, very Yeah, because you, you go away to Greece and just, like, start baiting everyone with just <laughs> random cats that you find. Some would call it baiting, others would call it a gift, <laughs> which I'm sure they'll soon agree with. But, uh, yes, let's get to who is joining us today. Uh, so we are joined by some good old Well Good Movies regulars uh, following their fun in the Endgame Centenary special, just like last time when we had uh, Paul and Aaron this time, they're not the winners, unfortunately. Uh, so in VHS Corner this week, it's Mary Munoz. Hello, Mary. Hello. I, I love the fact that you introduced us with the fact that we weren't the winners. As if that's a, a sore that has not, like, it's not gone away. I'm still traumatized to be clear, by that experience. To be clear, he said you're not the winner. He didn't say how you placed in Vegas. Yes, yeah. <laughs> And I, 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 think want, the, I think the insinuation was clear. <laughs> I wanted you guys to embrace the the pride in your your performance, regardless of whether it was good or bad. <laughs> I mean, I still maintain we did really well, especially when Love decided to give up halfway through and eat an Easter egg instead. Yeah, I think that was and and you were crazy. Quality uh, quizzing. and you accused Craig of sexism during <laughs> so just that, a standard that. well good movies experience. Yes, yeah. I'm sorry. What like not not to sound like a, an opponent of the Me Too era, but why does <laughs> them standing up to me with regards to sexism on on claims that were just like fraudulent? <laughs> it's just because it's the episode in which you're in full control, and just the fact that Mary was just like, no, I'm gonna like take this guy down. I was like, yeah, respect. <laughs> <laughs> I still have that little voice clip that you sent through. <laughs> it's like my favourite thing in the world. <laughs> so yeah, welcome Mary. And of course you are joined, uh, as we've said, by your teammate uh, in that episode. Uh, over in the movie vault this week, it's Liv McIndoe. Hello, Liv. Hello, hello. I, I just want it noted that it was quite a while ago that this whole in-game malarkey happened. And I feel like I won and I can't remember enough of it to think that that's wrong well the fact that mary said you were eating an easter egg then yeah it is clear that that was a while ago i guess anyway we'll uh, soon get to more uh, carnage and fun i'm sure but without further ado let's get to today's film so craig can you let us know what we'll be discussing and how we came to talk about it certainly so in the last episode we were watching hannah montana the movie where our buddy cop duo of potter and klein Aaron and Paul, go head to head, in, uh, head to head in our end game about the side hustles of various actors in the game simply known as Best of Both Worlds. Paul was the eventual winner and decided yet again to go with one of his favourite films of all time, Coyote Ugly. I want it noted that he has said that if we do not put this in the movie vault, he is boycotting the show from, from now on. And based on the conversations I had briefly with you guys beforehand, um, I would like to say it's been it's been an honour knowing Paul. Um <laughs> So yeah, let's actually talk about Coyote Ugly then. So, graced with a velvet voice, 21-year-old Violet Sanford heads to New York to pursue a dream of becoming a songwriter, only to find her aspirations sidelined by the accolades and notoriety she received at her day job as a barmaid at Coyote Ugly. The Coyotes, as they are affectionately called, tantalize customers and the media alike with their outrageous antics, making Coyote Ugly the watering hole for guys on the prowl. That, that synopsis makes it sound like there's no conflict, but there obviously is conflict, which we'll get into. But let's look at the crew. So this was directed by uh, David McNally, uh, who is known for only one other film, 
However, it was one of my favorite films as a kid, which was, of course, the infamous Kangaroo Jack. He did, in, uh, he did, however, have an assistant director in David Kelly, which I can't imagine would have been confusing on set at all. Um, this was written by Gina Wendkos, edited by William Goldenberg, cinematography by Amir Mockery, composer Trevor Horn, and art direction Gay S. Bug uh, Buckley. So, for the cast, we have Piper Perabo as Violet Stanford, we have Adam Garcia as Kevin O'Donnell, John Goodman as Bill, Maria Bello as Lil, Isabella Miko as Cammy, Tyra Banks as Zoe, Bridget Moynihan as Rachel, Melanie Linsky as Gloria, De Del Pentecost as Lou, Michael Weston as Danny, and Leanne Rhymes as Leanne Rhymes. So, that is the film that we're discussing today. I love how you said Leanne Rhymes as it, not herself. <laughs> I mean, I wrote it. I just decided, nah, it, sound, it sounds a bit weird. Okay, so let's talk all about Coyote Ugly from 2000 and ask the question of whether it deserves the honour of a place in our movie vault, our vault that encapsulates memorable movies for all time. And I guess as Craig teased there, we're also going to be asking the question of whether Paul is boycott boycotting the podcast. Been nice knowing you, Paul. <laughs> So, yeah, Coyote Ugly from 2000. Again, recently we have talked a lot about films from this kind of era. Uh, some of those joining us today have also talked about films within the 90s and noughties when they've joined us recently and have talked about similar-ish films in the past. Uh, one in particular, which was brought up uh, when this film was chosen and when I brought it up to them uh, when we were revealing what film we would be discussing and you know i guess we're halfway ish through the year now so i think it's also a good time to recap what we have been discussing uh craig was kind of alluding to it earlier as well in the fact that we've had a few trends uh, but so far we've had batman mask of the phantasm high school musical rocky horror picture show stepmom uh history of violence yesterday the lord of the rings witness mad max Fury road halloween recess schools out and hannah montana the movie so Mary, what, what do you think of that collection of, uh, of films there? You were there for stuff like Stepmom, were, were quite heavily involved in the choice of something like uh, History of Violence. You know, is this keeping up with, the, with some of those films? I think it's clear from that list that I am the only guest that you have with good taste in <laughs> films. It also reminds me of when we were talking about Mad Max and you were saying, you know, it was a very lads, dad kind of movie. And again, I yeah. guess this has kind of gone back to that as well with Coyote Ugly. Well, I don't, I mean, I can see why this would be appealing to lads yes. and dads. But I think for me, I, so I was too young to see this when it came out. But I remember a lot of girls in school being able to get into it because it was like an older age category. And I'm really mm. short and I wasn't even getting into 12. So when I was 12. <laughs> but this been such a huge thing and girls wanting to do like dance routines and stuff like that I feel like this is like one of those quintessential sort of early 2000s girly mm, yes. movies as well um which I'm sure we'll come on to discuss later there's a whole host of problems with that in <laughs> itself but I'll say nothing for now <laughs> yeah it yeah it's true that uh it's got the the male appeal in a different way it's kind of the male gaze but not so much the appeal of the story like I said I think that does lean more heavily female and and you are right again that there has been you know this following of uh, girls and stuff who would like to sort of like imitate sort of like songs and dance routines possibly from this film rightly or wrongly I mean thankfully the only thing that we've really seen from that perspective is just so many people wanting to sing can't fight the moonlight mm, yeah exactly Liv what is uh, what was your reaction uh, to this film being suggested i can't remember i think you just said like oh god I, I i wasn't even sure if you there was a reaction of like i've seen this i haven't seen this yeah um so i'd never heard of it but i googled it and sorry then what I was, oh, uh i i've heard of the bar i'd never heard of the film oh. and um i asked my friends about it after this was picked and um one of them works in coyote ugly and said this film uh traumatized her and is everything wrong with the job and then oh, I asked God. one of my friends who's seen it and he said it was the worst part of his childhood. So going into it, I was <laughs> not given the best reviews. <laughs> Paul, I will remember. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, 
That's, I love how as well Liv's, most people's reaction to the bar would be like, ah, oh, yes, based on the famous movie. And Liv's there like, ah, oh, yes, the film based on the famous bar. <laughs> you know? I live near it. <laughs> You must have been watching this being like, I'm surprised they got enough of a film out of the premise of just people dancing a bar. Yeah, I would love to, like, if you had, like, gone to that bar before and then we're watching this film, like, but where's the representation of this from the bar, not the other way around, of going to the bar and wanting stuff from the film? <laughs> you say that at multiple times in the film, my brain did think, well, this is nothing like the one in Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that did happen. We've had very interesting reactions of people recently because... Last time we were talking about Hannah Montana, the movie, four men talking about Hannah Montana, the movie, in which it's kind of like, is there anyone here who's going to have experience of this? We said that Aaron might do because he had quite a strength in the Endgame special with films from his childhood, which his sisters had watched. But no, he was all in on the Hannah Montana himself. <laughs> he, yeah. he, he knew the characters and stuff. So there was quite a good uh, bit of representation. And there. also hated the film on the basis of it was a poor representation of the show that he loved. Yeah, whereas we thought Paul, again, as the high school musical guy, would be into it but never seen it before so yeah this time we've got the angle of like somebody who lives next to the bar you know so that that's a that's a new one mary i i, I alluded to you earlier as well so your reaction was of course Showgirls. i've already been punished by watching showgirls why are you making me do this i yes. think was roughly <laughs> what i said <laughs> <laughs> yeah. not another showgirls was uh yeah the kind of feeling yeah. of like oh no we i think so I think we do need to be slightly fair to this film. It is better than Showgirls. It's not saying much, but it is better than Showgirls. Is it? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay, this is going to be even more interesting than I thought. And Craig, what, uh, do you had much experience of this before? So I had started watching this film years ago. I think it was, I think like Paul joked about the fact it's on like ITV2 all the time. Yes, yes. I think probably... I remember watching from when she first starts working at the bar up until uh, one of the later incidents at the bar. I know that's not really descript um, of how much I've seen. I definitely remember what uh, seeing the uh, her completely hosing the fire marshal mm. um, and remember having the same level of confusion as, well, wait a minute. Why Why did the one waitress tell her to do it when everyone else was like, aha, no, you leave him alone, you give him what he wants. It's like, this seems like a, by the way, this is a thing you should know if you're going to work here kind of thing. Yes, yes. Um, but whatever. Uh, yeah, so I've never seen this film all, uh, all the way through um, to the point that I wasn't even sure exactly to what extent uh, Can't Find the Moonlight was even going to factor into the film. Obviously, I knew it was going to be a song that she wrote at some point. I just didn't know it was going to be like in a in like a show showcase thing towards the end of the film. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it probably says enough that if I if I saw that much but never felt compelled to go, yeah, I'll hunt out the rest of this film. Mm. Um, that's pretty much all the experience I have. Yeah, I think mine's quite similar. And I think it kind of reminds me as well of when we talked about uh, The Full Monty yeah. of one of those films when you're growing up. And when we talked about that film, Darren mentioned, you know, like family movie nights and The Full Monty was one of those weird films during that period in which you're like, why are the family watching this? Should, you know, should everyone be enjoying this kind of strip film? And, you know, I think Coyote Ugly maybe, like said, came out of that a bit more because it wasn't like comedic in the sense of like it was you know male strippers um so i don't think it quite had the same kind of like family kind of viewership but i think there was an element of like my parents might have watched it and whether i was there or whether there was an element of like oh you're too young for this or something like that but i always remember it being around it like said being you know shown on television a lot maybe seeing bits of it and kind of like seeing parts of the film here and there um, feeling like I had watched it through different chunks and knowing so much about it, seeing the bars and all that kind of stuff, but never being compelled to, to watch it in its entirety because it just didn't seem like there was anything as a, as a big hook. So, you know, I, I did enjoy the opportunity of like being like, OK, well, you know, this is a reason to watch it rather than just like, I'm not sure if there ever would have been a reason which I'm like, I'm going to check on Coyote Ugly, you know what I mean? So uh, at least I've got that reason for having watched it. But I think initial thoughts, I think I'm very interested in what everyone thinks. Uh, probably it's most clear at this stage, maybe what Mary thinks. But uh, I'll go to Liv first, especially because of that tease of uh, having such bad reviews going in. So I'm very interested in what her initial thoughts were. So Liv, what, what are your overall opinions of Coyote Ugly after watching it? 
I mean, it wasn't the worst film I've seen. There are at least 12 films I've seen that are worse than this. <laughs> um, I I liked um, that you can make memes out of it. The the good moment about uh, what what did he say about the the subway handles, um, subway railings potentially uh, causing you know big whole pandemic. I, I... I sent this to David. I was like, I'm five minutes in, and there's already a line. I'm like, Ugh. yes, not not age well. Yeah, but then um, also like uh, things like the watering down the uh, the like fire warden and things like that. There are memeable scenes, and I mm. appreciate a memeable scene, but it was not good. Plot wise, character wise, any chemistry between character wise, any nuanced um, fleshing out of personality or anything like that of background characters, and most importantly, the point of it. <laughs> what was the point of it? <laughs> I liked the song. I'll give you that as well. I did like the song, but I liked the song before seeing the film. Um, so I was, I would have been fine not watching the film. I don't regret it. But this is the best review I find I can possibly give of it. <laughs> As much appreciated. Yeah, I think that's a good summary. Um, Mary, I guess maybe a more damning review for yourself, <laughs> potentially. I, th- I just, the minute I started watching it, I was like, oh, I remember what sexy looked like in the early 2000s. There was a lot of rhinestone jeans <laughs> and cowboy boots and I don't know, a lot of hair swinging about it just for Black me there was just, jackets <laughs> yeah just it, it was it was very it's very like time apparent I think the minute mm. you start watching it I think for me there was just too much cliches so there's like the dead mum the small town girl goes to the big city there's the bitchy girl at the bar there's the fallout and the misunderstanding between the lovers and there's I think maybe two montages at least so for me it was just really empty like don't get me wrong soundtrack was amazing loads and loads of good tunes in there but i think i'm with Liv. i just didn't understand what the point of it was fair well what it's funny you like reeled off the kind of like predictable stuff because i was thinking that as i watched it and i could actually hear you in my head that it, i can't remember the exact line at the end where she's like did you find your dream and i could just imagine you just go like <laughs> 100 percent gagged while i was watching that i just i've never i mean don't get me wrong there's lots of films where i've seen people with like personality vacuums or charisma vacuums or whatever but i think in this film it's just so so apparent as well that they're really pushing this love story on you as a viewer and these are two people who <laughs> I, I just don't understand why this is supposed to be some big great romance but i think that's very in keeping with how a lot of early 2000s films were and as we've mentioned showgirls and you know we talked about quality wise i guess this would at least be less egregious than that you know as if we're talking from a quality storytelling point of view maybe like you said is it is it better is it you know worse but at least i guess it hasn't kind of got the the vulgarity of, of showgirls i don't know part of me now i mean and i cannot believe i'm at these words are coming oh. out of my mouth but <laughs> Part of me now, I'm like, well, at least Showgirls kind of had the balls to do what it did. This is just really, like, bo- not boring, but just, like, very average and mediocre and very safe. Mm. Okay. we've Yeah, we've come full circle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can't believe I'm now looking at Showgirls and going, what's that? A better yeah. film? <laughs> <laughs> You're just there watching watching this, being like, man, I wish I was watching Showgirls. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Craig, what's your overall thoughts? So... I actually do see the point of this film. However, I just don't think that the film does a very good job at actually achieving that point. It's very much meant to be a, it's meant to be a film that sort of depicts the, uh, depicts the idea of in order to have any significant change in your life, you need to be, you need to be daring. You need to be willing to go for the things that terrify you in order to be able to achieve, right? The problem is what they're trying to, emphasize in this film as like her her safety net her fallback her she feels comfortable here therefore she doesn't want to leave this one is already a very extravagant uh like out there kind of bar which already seems to be pushing pushing her with regards to a lot of what she feels comfortable with already in the first place but two doesn't actually seem to make any reference within the film to her actually you know feeling comfortable and feeling that she wants to just stay confined in there, right? I I feel like 
we literally go from the scene where she starts like opening up, you know, doing the sort of singing along to the jukebox right into, by the way, I've got an opportunity for you to sing in an actual club and sing your own songs. And it's just nothing in, it's just nothing in between. It's the film has identified that those are the points that it needs to get to. Um, but instead of actually doing the moments to be able to actually show her character, they focus so much on the, what is the gimmick of the bar this time? Oh, I know there's going to be, there's going to be the fire marshal. There's going to be fist fights. There's going to, as an aside, I'm still a bit confused as to how half the, the fist fights in that bar actually broke out in the first place. Um, uh, which is a thing. Um, unlike you guys, I was okay with the romance a little bit. If It probably did move a bit too fast, but I thought like the sort of the initial stages of it, I thought were kind of char- kind of charming. Um, I think it's that, I think it's that thing of, uh, he is, it is unrealistically, unrealistic for him to get the kiss as quickly as he did. I thought like the, I would kiss you, but like the fish smell, I thought was, oh, okay, that's actually quite a nice way of avoiding it. And then afterwards, like, nah, I want the kiss. Oh, for goodness sake. Um, so aspects of it was fine. Um, I, I, I quite, I quite like the, uh, the, 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 the amazing Spider-Man Punisher comic being quite prevalent throughout the film. It's quite nice that, because obviously back in those, uh, back in those days as well, like, uh, geek culture was not positively portrayed often. So the fact that it wasn't really a joke of it, apart from just, ah, look at the butch guy with the coffee. He's like, no, I really like this thing. Shut up. It's like, all right, cool. We embrace it. Um, if I'm looking for any selling points for the film, I'll give it that. But yeah, I mean, this it's just another, it's just another film, which is just like trying to be pl- flashy, but not actively doing the, the things that it needs to be doing. I even thought, I even thought some of the dynamic, John Goodman disappointed me in this film, I can't lie, because I was bigged up big time by Paul being like, oh, John Goodman in this film is really good. And half the fil- half the time I was like, he just seems miserable for the sake of being miserable. And even the reason that they reveal for him just being sad, which is just, oh, uh, my wife had these dreams and I, I let her give them up um, because that's the sort of person I am. And now I've realized I shouldn't do that to you. I'm just like, that doesn't justify the fact that you, don't know where your socks are and the fact you're destroying them in the dryer. Um, that doesn't justify like literally seeing your daughter dancing in the bar and be like, I'm, I've never been more disappointed in you. Mm. Like what's the hell? Um, also the amount of like horrible U-turn she was doing in that, like in the actual toll booth was driving me insane. No pun intended. Cause I was like, let's give her a good luck. I can't do this. <laughs> what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> Stupid girl. Um, yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty much my two cents for also for a film that's meant to be her being a, uh, like a songwriter. We don't actually see a wide variety of songs that she's written. I think we get like a total of maybe three if I'm generous. Yeah, I guess that's where the film again is, you know, it has that kind of maybe identity crisis in that, you know, is this a film about a songwriter? Is this a yeah. film about a sleazy bar? You know, what what message are you say? And, you know, do you want to, to be like, yeah, I'm going to embrace being a bar dancer or, you know, is it like kind of like, oh no, this is horrible. I want to do what I want to do. So I think that that, that is a struggle with it. Um, and I guess, you know, similarly to Craig, I think that, um, you know, I, th- I think I'm more forgiving about certain elements of it. I think that a bit also like Showgirls, you know, maybe I'm a bit more on board for some of the kind of like nostalgia, kind of like time era of of the film. And I do think in the defense of what Paul said and John Goodman, I think, you know, I agree his, his character isn't all that great, but I think that him as an actor and I think a lot of the other actors are what makes this film at least work somewhat. I think that this could have, completely burned and failed if it wasn't for these actors i think that they do have enough charm and charisma that it just gets by so i'm not saying that it completely sells me but i'm like that film would have sorry that line would have like completely failed if it wasn't for you that you know kind of element so i think that i I like the kind of set in a way i thought that like the cinematography was quite cool and what it reminds me a lot of is like like a musical almost in some ways i think that i'm surprised this hasn't become like a big 
Broadway kind of stage show. I think they kind of almost... David, don't you dare wish that on anyone. <laughs> but I think the fact that this has become a bar also makes sense to me. And what I was most intrigued by at the start was the fact that it was a Jerry Bruckheimer film. And I was like, at the beginning, I was like, oh, okay. You know, my estimation went up a bit because, you know, I do like some of his stuff. And then halfway through, I was like, yeah, I can see how this is a Jerry Bruckheimer film because a lot of people will say this guy, one, knows how to make money. And, you know, if you look at things like the Pirates films and stuff like that, he clearly knows how to kind of sell a kind of experience or like a, you know, a ride, basically. So the fact that this has become a bar in the same way Pirates of the Caribbean was a ride turned into a film has kind of then made the ride popular again, you know, whichever way you want to say it. I think I can see that with this is that it's very, you know, cookie cutter. And they knew that going in. And it seems to have that kind of like maybe grease appeal or something the showgirls was going for as well of like, well, we need to give people what they want in terms of like having these kind of like raunchy scenes, but maybe they kind of like scaled it back a bit so they didn't go too, too showgirls. But um, there's enough romance and everything there as well for people to be on board. And I didn't know if they were going down the kind of grease root of being like oh yeah good girl turns bad i think there's like a kind of element of that at the beginning where you know she's kind of like all shy and everything like that again that's where the film seems to have some sort of identity crisis but unlike greece i'm glad they didn't go down that because i don't think <laughs> that is a good message to be like yeah to become a different person you know <laughs> but uh i think that again the performances and some of the lines and moments won me over enough that i thought i you know i had no okay time but i think what we said before with the initial reaction would i have kept it on if i wasn't reviewing it possibly not because there just wasn't enough to engage me but i do think that it has enough moments um and enough going for it that i can see why it's popular and i could kind of enjoy certain elements of it yeah just to be clear from my perspective i don't hate this film no but i also i'm also not gonna stand in anyone's way who does hate this film <laughs> well yeah i think everyone i think even people who've had the, the issues again it's kind of like you know what is this film meant to be isn't it you know what so it's nothing like egregiously i hate unless anybody is gonna come, come out with stuff but then mary you did say you had some long notes about the romance and and certain representations but yeah it's again it's not that i hate it it's just that i'm going to forget about this film in a week's time and it's never going to pop into my head ever again i think that's my issue with it whereas not to go back to showgirls example but i will still think about that and little scenes and little bits this i will completely forget about and i think it's because it it does just feel and it's interesting that you see the, the jerry bruckheimer thing and the cookie cutter thing because it does just very much feel like a like a cash cow type of thing. It's very much of an ilk of film that came out in that particular time period. But yeah, it's just, it's so forgettable. And that's why I'm so shocked that it's somebody's favourite film of all time. Like, really? Of all time? It's just, there's there's nothing about this that I'm going to remember in, once we've stopped talking about it. <laughs> I guess the question I've now got is, because Liv, you said that your friend was like traumatised by this film as, as a kid. <laughs> One, did they tell you what exactly it was? Was Two, if they didn't, could you work out based on the film what it was that traumatised them? That was such a convoluted question. Um, I wasn't told why the, it felt convoluted. Okay. okay. Um, I wasn't told why the film traumatised them, but the way they said it, um, there was an implication that they had to watch it multiple times because it was their mother's favourite film. And that it was that bad that watching it multiple times almost put them off the films. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> well, there is that. Yeah. From their perspective. And then the kind of experience of the person who works at the bar, like take that. I guess the the worst elements of this have then fed into the bar. Yeah, I think um, for them, it's like everyone goes in now with an expectation that you're going to hose them down and mm. you're going to like. I don't know, start bidding wars over the quasi strippers and having walked past the bar a few times, it just kind of looks a bit like a cheap Albert Schloss, but where people wear more denim. So like, I'm assuming like uh, expectation versus reality has been a little incongruent since this, since this film was made. Yeah, I think that's what's in, well, I think one of the strongest parts of the film and again that's where i was watching it kind of be like okay i could see again why somebody would enjoy this and i think this is where the film really is at its strength is like when she first goes in there and you kind of see the chaos of the place and the the women who work there um like one of my favorite lines i think is when the owner is kind of saying about uh the girl who's kind of like the more 
aggressive one and she was like oh yeah she's got several you know like cases against her and stuff like that and it's just like this guy wanted to sue it i give her a raise and it was just like it's so cheesy and corny but i thought i was like this is f- like fun i thought that, again that's where that kind of like show musical aspect came out to me in which i was like that is incredibly silly and dumb but i could get on board with it in that circumstance of when it's embracing the kind of chaos and stuff i think again it's whether you kind of like invested in that from the get go, like again, like a stage show, rather than being like, this is why everyone is attending this bar. This is why it's so famous. It's just kind of like, it just is, you know, <laughs> like you're just like, okay. Um, and I guess that, you know, that's where it's a difficult one. And I think that this type of film, it does, it, it's, it's kind of like, riding the coattails of being kind of mediocre in a way of like you know we know that this is kind of like very average but we'll just be like slightly okay that you know people can like it enough but there won't be anybody who has major problems with it so we'll hence be popular just through being pleasing enough to everyone kind of thing but i thought that there were moments in which there was just enough little shining gems that i was like oh that was fun that was a that that was a quirky little line um but then equally you know there's still problems and and but moments I didn't think that, work. It was the fact that they were all moments that made it have no atmosphere. Mm. Like it was it was saying certain things about things a person had done instead of having the presence of that character yeah. being like that on screen. It was like seeing the occasional fight within a crowd that gets immediately broken up instead mm. of always having the tossle of, of the crowd pushing and being on the verge of the fight. It, it was just... The fact that they were throwing things in because they felt like they had to have these embellishments to draw people in was what stopped it having any sense of emotion. Well, the the craziest one for me was the montage sort of sequence in which like they're just like, let's show them playing baseball. I was like, why? <laughs> and they're like, they're distracting the players with baseball. And, you know, like, and then she's like writing songs and, you know, it's, and then it, cl- you know, very, this is where I think it gets the most cliche of like, oh no, you know, she, it's like her boyfriend hates her and her dad hates her and she's lost her job. And, you know, it's like, yeah, oh God, you know. And she's received so many of these rejection yeah. uh, letters. So I do have a question, which is just an aside. I just want to know how the people at the back of the bar ever get served. That's just yeah. a question I'm going to float out there because it yes. really annoyed me when I was watching it. <laughs> the female representation I really struggle with, um, I think from the offset, um, like when she goes into that first uh, record office and you have the sassy black character oh, yeah, who that tells her life good. story, it's that made me feel just really uncomfortable. It was just really poorly written and and just a terrible, terrible stereotype. Um, and in terms of representation... It was as if somebody actually told her, like she was swaying her head and they were like, do more of that, you know, kind of thing. It was like, that yeah, was like the bad it, stereotype. It was just really, really bad. And I think that, you know, you've got Bridget Moynihan as Rachel and she's meant to be kind of bitchy, but aggressive, but we all make jokes about the anger problems that she has. And then you have Tammy, who I think is called the Russian as well. And she's obviously, there's like a bit of like blonde totty, which I guess was like an early 2000s thing as well. Maria Bello obviously is meant to be sort of the tough bar mother. I just find everything so two dimensional. And like even that scene where she like rips the sleeves off of Violet's top to make her look more sexy. Oh, Jesus, it's so bad just talking about it. Never mind watching it. Um, and I think for me, what I struggled with most is that I didn't feel that um, Piper a uh, parabo or is that how you say her name parabo yeah yeah i didn't really feel like she had much presence so yeah she was quite a meek character and i get that she was meant to be this sort of small town girl but like she got what a total of seven rejections in the in the hour and 40 minutes like in new york that's probably that's like a day <laughs> that's not like a big deal but i just found her character really quite insipid and not somebody who i was emotionally invested in even when they brought in the backstory of her mother and this hereditary stage fright and all that nonsense it it still didn't make me feel anything towards it. i just i this is what I, my big problem with it is i just find it all so vacuous and that's where i really struggled to connect with any of it because the dialogue's ropey the script is full of cliches and the characters there was nothing for me to engage with there because it just felt it was like okay you're the sassy one you're the small town girl you're the sexy one and you're the rude one and there was nothing more to it than that i love the um the kind of you know where i was talking about how kind of like cookie cutter this is and the cheesiness of it is the scene where 
and this is the most cliche I think it gets at times in which they're like, you know, and now this bit happens and now the camera goes to this is when the film where the bar is kind of like breaking out into chaos and she has to like sing for the first time. And it's like, and now to shot of girl getting taken advantage of and now get shot of like, you know, the barmaid being overrun and now shot of this. And like when she stands up and like she looks, it's like the mic is there. And the fact that like the owner actually says like, they're tearing this place apart. <laughs> I was like, I felt like I was in a video game or something like you know when there's like uh you know the bot characters just like oh no quickly pick up the mic <laughs> press a press a and it's like go into the mic like press x to pick up the mic <laughs> you know it just felt very kind of forced um at that moment i will say i will say in what world does somebody picking up a mic and starting to sing make everyone who is already filled with alcohol and testosterone punching the living life uh living life out of each other actually just be like you know what we're gonna stop and be enchanted by this it's somebody just singing one way or another yeah. like crying out loud i know it wasn't even like this big meaningful song it was just like a genetic pop song but you couldn't hear and it I, much over you know <laughs> yeah it was and i was laughing as well because obviously i kind of get the feeling it's meant to be this sort of like rough and ready bar and is you know, as Craig said, what's going to make them stop like actually like fighting each other to go oh my god enchantress she's singing it just yeah, there's there's so many issues I have with this film. I guess Paul mentioned last time, um, th- and, you know, I do agree with him to a certain extent, and again, looking through the lens of showgirls, etc. But, you know, this film is less egregious in the, you know, I guess there's the element you said, Mary, that they don't at least go there. But in terms of, like, th- it, there's still an element of, like, oh, well, we're not just kind of, like, exploiting these women and kind of, like, sort of, hers a character as well you know she doesn't sort of like ever kind of like really kind of lose touch with who she is she kind of remains kind of like decently dressed throughout the film and that kind of thing but i think yeah, but there are also just the, the incredibly like bs rules that's put upon her which is just don't bring your boyfriend to the bar mm-hmm. you must appear available but um uh at all times yeah, I think that's the bits which I kind of wish they went further with again is like, you know, like showgirls, but like, do you go down this line of just being like, well, this is the person it makes you and, you know, like this is the seedy dark place it is. Um, or do you go down what she later says in which she's like, you know, it's just a bar. And she was like, well, if it's just a bar, you wouldn't be so concerned. So at that point, I'm like, well, are you going down the like she wants to be a singer and she wants to be out of you? Or is it the like, you know, the kind of element of what you get in something like in the heights or something which the character is like oh you know what i actually found that everything i was looking for this whole time was here all along kind of cheesy thing i also just think that there needs to be scenes where the actual coyotes are either just bonding with each other Mm -hmm. because i think there's a lot of implied bonding to the point that even when they all turn up they they all close the bar early and turn up to the the showcase i'm just i am questioning wait why are you doing this from what my understanding is especially for someone like Rachel, it seemed like you guys were not friends. Um, all you ever seem to do is either stitch her up or question, oh, why are you getting, why are you so hyper fixated on the fact that all she did was just sing a song, uh, etc. Why are you, why are you there? Why are you now in a situation where somebody's ogling her from the crowd and you feel free, free to just punch this guy, which as an aside, always fun when creeps like that mm-hmm. get punched. But I was just, I was like, I, my, to my understanding, you guys are just not friends. Uh, not even like the baseball scene convin- could convince me that you guys are friends. Um, so yeah, I think just more of that actually just needed to happen. Well, it's probably a problem of, again, being split between audiences. Because if you have to put girls bonding into the runtime, you've got to take out the voyeurism or at least a bit of it. So which audience are you targeting? I completely agree and I think that when Dave said it doesn't feel as exploitative I actually this feels super exploitative to me watching it back and and I think that it's so designed for male audiences and I think I actually have a note here that says so much uh, of the scenes of the girls having fun feels forced and cheesy and it's because you don't have that build up you don't have the time to see women establishing relationships with each other and actually even just this whole notion of Rachel being somehow jealous of Violet and doing things to undercut her and undermine her is also a really toxic stereotype about women not helping each other out in workplaces as well and not having each other's back. So I do think that there's an exploitation thing here that that's why we're not seeing the 
softer side and in inverted comma of the girls and how they actually get along because the particularly in the early 2000s women were meant to be like feisty and sexy and you know pitted up against each other and literally sort of you know in this film in particular you know they literally stand in a line in a bar to be ogled at and it's like well you've got the tall one and you've got the blonde one and you've got this one so it's like every single sort of I don't want to say body type because they're all extremely tall and skinny but there's what I assume was considered like sort of different male fantasies of that era lined up literally for you too. So it does at. it does seem to feel like they justify a lot of this exploitation on the basis of well it's women running it therefore a lot of them more freely opt into this more than say like the the sort of showgirls environment where obviously it's meant to be portrayed as like quite seedy as like, it's the men consistently controlling it but here oh no it's women so obviously it's more of a collect uh more of a collective experience they have more control over it but yeah yeah they it just doesn't but also the fact that because they don't want to portray it as such they sort of just skim over these aspects and just go well by the end of it she still feels fine to just she's left the bar so it can't be that exploitative it's not like they're tra trapping her and the fact that she freely goes back and can still do those things she can still uh like get on the megaphone and do things like sell her father which <laughs> That's a badly explained film plot that I'm waiting for somebody to do. Just girl goes to New York, discovers the discovers the secret of happiness is selling her own father. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, and I think you're both right. And what what I was thinking in terms of like it's less egregious with showgirls is just the you haven't the visual. You haven't got weird like fucking in a pool. I agree with you. Yes, like, exactly. That but the surface level visuals, you know, the the actual like nudity and the kind of like ogling and that kind of stuff. Um but yeah, I think in terms of its representations of the relationships and kind of like the the stereotypes, I think that that isn't as great. Um probably again what I was also thinking and I know that Paul sort of said this before is that I think that there would be people who would say that maybe the fact that they show like John Goodman dancing on the bar but also the boyfriend gets up and kind of does like a sort of like oh subject. he's forced into it let's be completely well, fair regardless though I think she it, looks at him like a piece of meat it's just like you're gonna give me exactly what I need yeah but I think get up <laughs> but similar to like I don't know whether it's like full Monty or something but I think th there is an element of like, you know, you see women l lusting after men and you see men lusting after women. So there's, you know, that I, does again, not make I, any of it okay. Yeah, no, but I just say there's some <laughs> they form. Do not, do not die on this hill. <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to say for what I know Paul was maybe trying to say. Um, well, it's not like we're going to be talking to Paul for much longer. <laughs> so. I felt it was there. I'm not, again, I'm not saying that it was done well or anything, but it was like, it didn't just go down the one road and say it was okay. There was a kind of element of like, like Full Monty. There was like, oh, well, women love this stuff and men love no, this stuff. This, you know? this is literally why we're here to be like, okay, so it tries to do these things, but, but to, what ex yeah. to what extent does it? This is where like our ideologies on film just do come to clash again. Well, I don't think we're it like, comes to clash because I'm not saying I think no, no, that it, it does it, it well. It, it's either. concept versus execution. Yeah. And it's like, the concept behind it is fine. It's just like, yeah, but... Well, yeah, you know, that that's... A, that's what I mean. I'm not dying on the hill because I don't greatly believe in that point. I'm just making it. <laughs> it's, not, just, it's there. You you're know, not I'm dying on the hill because Die Hill is not here. <laughs> it, yeah, it, it's there. But yeah, I can't die on the hill because, yeah, I don't think it is, you know, a great defense for that. I think, like you said, the, the relationships and the, the, the stereotypical views of those characters make it, you know, more troublesome. And even him dancing on the bar and stuff like that, again, is is not a great reflection of anybody or the stereotypes you would have within that scenario. Um, and this idea of people just like, they all are like, oh, yeah, I'll buy him and stuff like that. It's just like, really, you know, did we have to go down that road? You know, like, <laughs> and you know, whether a few of the people in the crowd could have done that maybe, but the fact that they're all like lusting after him, is just like a bit unbelievable i am a bit saddened especially when it gets to like john goodman on the bar they're going like oh take it off take it off he starts to and then somebody just starts yeah start put it back on please i'm like yeah screw you yeah that's why i was thinking in contrast as well is because he has that kind of like oh look he's gonna show his ass and stuff like that and you're like okay well you know that's kind of funny but then the fact that then they do that with john goodman you're like oh well you've just ruined what you said up earlier mary all i was gonna say is uh, one I actually really like the John Goodman dance in the bar which I don't understand because it makes no sense really but I just thought it was kind of cute and he seemed to be enjoying himself but during the auction scene where Kevin is getting auctioned where 
where did all these like middle class businessmen come from? This seems like a dive bar, and all of a sudden these women in like blouses and perils are like all seventy dollars and take it off and all the rest of it. It's just another random plot point that makes no sense. Yeah, that's why it's like if the film is called Coyote Ugly and they say, why do you call it Coyote Ugly and all this kind of thing? It's like if you could focus more on the bar and like, you know, what is who is the audience of this bar? Like you said, because one minute you've got like just men there, the next minute you've got like business women, etc. So a bit of context there, a bit of background could have helped. It does feel like the film could work if it were literally the same plot, but the bar itself is not significantly famous. To the point that it's just like a regular bar that just gets a bit rowdy and she's in the same environment. and that, But it's still about her fundamentally wanting to pursue uh, the songwriting. Or if it's literally just the bar is so famous, she has these dreams, she's just willing to give them up and then it's just the chaos of that. Yeah, I think it's just poor form to try and merge the two into one. Because it almost felt like at times that they were trying to say that the bar was going to make her the person she'd become, like it would toughen her up. Yeah. But even that doesn't quite pan out. So again, I feel like there is an idea there. It just, it, it's executed terribly. I mean, regardless of um, whether or not they executed that well, I don't think anything could successfully toughen her up at the point where she started off being someone so stupid that she would want to go out with a guy who lied to her to pretend he was a music producer to sleep with her. So as far as I'm concerned, nothing can toughen her up. So it's okay that the film failed. Yeah, the film's ambiguous about this because obviously it's it's also shown as it was not his idea to do this. He went along um, with it. Still yeah, went this, along this, is with it. Yeah. this is the ambiguity. This is the ambiguity of it, right? For what it, for what it's worth, I think he does redeem himself along the way. Mm. Um, but yeah, absolutely right. It's just not not a great look to start out with, especially because he not long after that says something about like not being able to not look at her ass yeah yeah yeah. that entire that entire part of it was incredibly creepy the fact is like i've i've been you've been following me now for like 20 minutes and i've told you to go go away several times like yeah that's not a great look and the fact they sort of almost introduce him as this like sort of like playboy type character where that guy tries to make her think he's like a producer and it doesn't quite work because again i think maybe there's what you're saying about the spider-man thing it reminds me a bit of like topher grace what they tried to do with him of being like oh the guy from that that 70 show and let's throw him into like you know spider-man 3 and i think he was in uh bad that bad rom-com uh win a date with tad hamilton or something like that's one of those films has just been on in the background in the past why does that make me worry that that's going to be a film suggestion at some point (laughs) so topher grace is in that film as the like you know the nerdy guy who like she should have gone with all along instead of tad hamilton the kind of big like macho guy and it's like so that was kind of like a thing at that time and to like spider-man and things like that but i think the fact that they introduce him like speaking to all these women he very is clearly like a good-looking guy so it's not like topher grace in which he's like oh okay well he's got his like uh appealing factors but he's also just like a skinny kind of like you know alternative kind of guy it's like you don't ever buy that like oh he's just like the guy in the in the 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 back kitchen and everything and then when he gets up on the bar you know then the fact that everyone's bidding for him it's like again choose a lane is this the guy that's kind of like nerdy and that like not everyone has looked at but you kind of looked at him and thought oh he's sweet no no or is it the girl the guy that everyone is lusting after it's kind of like a bit no 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 i i think the fact that you're even thinking about like, oh, do you need to be in the lane of the nerdy? I think in and of itself is a problem. It feeds into like the stereotype I mentioned earlier about like only a certain kind of person can like comic books. And that often causes then a lot of the actual, you know, bullying of sort of people of that physique. I actually quite like the fact that he's of that sort of personality, that uh, that like body build, but just likes comic books on the side. I actually think that's a quite normalizing thing. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't disagree with that. I think it's just the... I don't know whether it's just the presentation of the character. The yeah, fact I that think he... it's it's actually showing that he has these different facts because they throw in the tragic backstory for him as well, don't they? About his childhood. Oh, the fact he's like an orphan, yeah. Yeah, but I do think the sort of joke, if you can call it that, is this conventionally handsome, charismatic person also happens to be very passionate about comic books i don't think it's like he's supposed to be a nerd i think the whole point is like that's just another facet to his personality is that he's got it almost in a way makes him slightly more interesting because there's a little bit of nuance there he's not just like a player he's somebody who actually has passions and interests and that's probably the nicest thing i'll say about this film 
Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I wouldn't want that stuff to be gone. I think it's just the fact that it's at sometimes he's a creep and sometimes he's showing to like be like hitting on these women and stuff at the beginning of the film. I think those two can co-align completely. It's like what you're saying is, oh, he's like lecherous after women, but also deals with a lot of women. I'm like, yeah, what's the contradiction <laughs> here? There is one massive contradiction, though, because he says he works like three hospitality jobs, right? He's always talking about how oh, he's yeah, dealing yeah, okay. and dealing. And yet at one point they show a close up of his wrist and he's, uh, of his wrist and he's wearing an Amiga. So that there is like that odd... You've obviously tried to style him in a certain way, but it's not in keeping with the character. I have no issue with him. Well, not that I, that no, it's not that I've got an issue with him being a creep. I obviously do, but I don't think him being lecherous and lusted after is any contradiction to the fact that he likes comic books. Yeah. I don't see the two being no. conflated yeah, at all. Yeah, I, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. I think that that that's what it is. It's like I don't have an issue with both of those things. I think it's what I was saying earlier is more just his casting and his appearance and everything, it's very hard to buy into. I'm not saying he needs to be there with glasses and look like a nerd, but it's just when he's this such conventionally handsome man and like the fact that he's shown to be like a player with these women has these other aspects, which I agree. I think that's good. We want him to be a multi-layered character and everything like that. But it just seems like the film just wants his cake and to eat it too. And the fact is presented in a film in which they've said, John Goodman, getting his ass out. We don't want that. And then every other character that we do see is all, and you know, if they've got something which is more interesting to them, they are all models, essentially. And the fact that he's there like, I can't get a job and I need to do all these different, all this different work and this and that and everything. It's like, really? You're like very attractive. Like, you know, what, what would be stopping you? I, I think you're definitely right on this. At the very least, just because if you can barely hold down a couple of like part-time and catering jobs, you probably can't afford to go to the gym enough to get those abs. <laughs> yeah. Plot yeah. It's the fact that like, you know, his colleagues are there just being like, oh yeah, that guy's the manager. <laughs> and I'm like, but it does look like he could be the manager. That's the problem. <laughs> That's I think the problem for me is like, he does look like he could be the manager. So what's the joke? You know, do you know what I mean? It's just like, and again, he's like, oh, you know, like I could hire a million of you. Like you're in the kitchen, blah, 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 blah. blah. And I'm like, again i don't even buy that he would be in the kitchen in the first place so it's like it's the believability for me like by all means attractive people and whatever you know people skinny or can all work in kitchens but i think it's just what they're saying to him just doesn't match what he actually looks like unfortunately i do okay i do get your point about that i do think though that to a certain extent um Adam Garcia, the actor, just looks like a sort of interchangeable early 2000s <laughs> yes, male yeah. movie star. Like they all kind of look the same yeah, at that time period. Yes, yeah. And yeah. so I think he's obviously been like, cast in the film for that particular reason. Like he has a look without presumably being like a name. Because nobody in, well, a couple of people are, were obviously quite well established by this point, but there's no massive big stars in this film beyond likes of like John Goodman and assume Tyra Banks by that time but he's not he's not like a named actor but he does just look a very generic what was seen as attractive in the early 2000s. Uh, Liv was there anything else major the source stood out to you whether it be problems or you think positives for the film? The problem is nothing actually stood out to me like there are things that have been mentioned in this call that I didn't even remember that I watched the film this morning and I didn't remember those things. I, I genuinely forgot with the two hours between watching this film and starting um, this recording, I forgot that she was down on her luck. Like that is how little I have to say about this film. Uh, like genuinely just no, just no. There, there have been films that are the same, but better before and after this film came out. The only possible reason I would have to watch this film is if someone said to me, I'm in the mood for something really naughties. And then I suggested about five films that are really naughties and they go, no, I mean, really naughties. Then I think, OK, maybe I'll put this on. Like, I've, I've literally got nothing else to say. I think if, if somebody was also like, I really want to watch a film about going to New York, being down on your luck, get into like stardom. And, you know, it's very much like it's such a typical New York person goes to film, you know, whether you were studying that type of movie or whatever, uh, you know, it's very cliche in that sense. And I think that, yeah, visually it has some fun moments and musically there's some, you know, great, 
bangers in there but uh yeah actually i'm gonna say something really controversial here to end my major contributions oh i don't think anyone in the film was that hot if this this film was supposed <laughs> to have something and it was supposed to have people being hot i don't think anyone was that hot not <laughs> after they'd been um written into the script or had their wardrobes done up but not before it at least have that please where <laughs> where's the major eye candy Where's okay? My brain's gone to George Lazenby. I don't think that's the kind of part I'm looking for in this film. But you understand what I mean. <laughs> that that's why we were struggling with this this these characters so much. We were just like, he's just not hot enough. <laughs> yeah, if if it's gonna be shallow, make them hotter than they were. And I, they were lovely people, very aesthetic. They didn't have the pizzazz of sex appeal. I love that. The perspective that we have is just like, oh yeah, there's an element of exploitation. Liv is like, I don't think it was exploitative <laughs> enough. <laughs> if you're going to exploit them, at least make it worthwhile. <laughs> and the tricky one as well is the like the whole like stage fright thing. I don't think that works too well. And again, well, she thinks this hereditary, I think, is like mm, is a bit stupid. Yeah. Yeah. Like her relationship with like her friends from home, like that was quite nice. I didn't understand why her friend was drinking Pepto Bismol when she's picking her up. I don't know if that's something that Mary needed to be drinking just to help the gag <laughs> gag in of uh, some of these horrible scenes. But I was just like, why is she drinking Pepto Bismol right now? Is she going to throw up or something? I, I think that's a stereotype, if I'm honest. I think as soon as you saw her French manicure, they established what type of character she was. And the Pepto Bismol is very much in keeping with the type of character they wanted to be and it's interesting because I was reading an interview with Melanie Linsky and she said she was under so much like she was like an American size four so UK size eight mm. at the time and the pressure that she felt during that film to become even thinner um, okay, because even though she was supposed to be a kind of trashy character it was like well, you couldn't be like a size eight and trashy oh. <laughs> do you know what I mean so I think that character is a bit another stereotype that I have mm. issue with I think that's where for me that her going back home and having that sort of friendship and saying like, oh, you know, your family's really important to me. Some of that was like nice in concept, but again, wasn't there enough. And I think the only stuff that kind of really stood out as maybe Craig was saying earlier, but didn't fully pull it through is the father daughter stuff, which is it's a bit confusing at times, but there's times in which it kind of works and maybe through John Goodman's performance and the actress's performance, um, you know, and there's that kind of like moment in the hostel where she's like, oh, is that Old Spice? And, you know, that some of that, is, you know, is, is okay. And I think that the, the kind of performance is pulled off. I do question what will nurses walking through a hospital hitting on patients. <laughs> yeah. And they could have, again, made that work a lot more. You know, you look at something like Frasier or something like that, in which Frasier's got like a tumultuous relationship with his dad. And there's like an episode where he's like, thinks he's got this shop with this woman. And then actually it turns out that the woman's more interested in his father than she is with him. It's like, you know, if you're going to go down that line of like, oh, make John Goodman this kind of like, you know, attractive character, you know, show why, you know, and show why these women are attracted to him rather than just like, oh, the nurse likes me. It's like, OK, why? <laughs> and we've got Confused Mary again. Off you go. Yeah, I'm, I'm really not following your train of thought at all for like the third time. In this uh, sorry, episode. sorry. It's just the fact that like it's what Liv said earlier. It's just there wasn't just enough context there as to why is this nurse and John Goodman hit it off. That's all I'm saying is just... You know, we get, like Craig said, he's also been miserable throughout the film, but there's nothing that we didn't get a, a, a scene in which she's come in and like, you know, he's kind of like charmed her or said something or whatever, you know, like, or they both enjoy food or whatever. You do like, wonder what's ended up in the cutting room floor of this film. Yes, I am quite yeah. intrigued. <laughs> to, yeah. I feel like context the, is missing from a lot yeah, of scenes. Because yeah. the other thing that it then implies is that, oh, his issue throughout this entire film is that he's just not been getting any. The moment that somebody shows him interest, he's like, I'm going to back off my daughter now. She can come back into yeah. my life and continue dancing in the bar now. That's what I thought was quite the 360 was at the end. He was like, I bought this autograph because I wanted to have the first autograph, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, one, I'm sure she signed something before that. You know, like that that can't be the first thing she's ever signed. <laughs> no, they're signed as an autograph though. Yeah. It's not like you're gonna be like, I have this letter for yeah. of attorney that is her first autograph. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But one, why do you have that? Yeah. But it's just yeah, going from the like I'm ashamed of you suddenly to that, he was so in on it. Um He just wasn't getting any. That was clearly his <laughs> issue. <laughs> All right, take those cassettes, rewind them and play them again because it's time for VHS Corner. So because she hasn't had to endure enough of this film, we asked Mary to actually talk us through some of the behind the scenes of this film. So Mary, take it away. 
So some fun facts for you all. I don't know if you noticed, but Johnny Knoxville and Michael B both have cameos in this film. Um, Jessica Simpson was offered the part of Violet, but turned it down due to the inclusions of sex scenes, which would eventually cut. And both Britney Spears and January Jones were also considered for the lead role. The film is based on a GQ article written by Elizabeth Gilbert, who also wrote Eat, Pray, Love. Um, after test screening, the filmmakers discovered from the audience that they wanted to see more of John Goodman, so new scenes with him were filmed and added to the final cut. Although Piper Carabo can actually sing, her voice was dubbed by Leanne Rhymes throughout. Um, Bridget Moynihan was so tall that they had to reconstruct the bar so that every time she was dancing, she wouldn't constantly be smacking her head off the top of it. I don't know how tall she actually is, but she must be a giant, I assume. Tyra Banks has petitioned the director for a sequel or a spin-off TV series, neither of which have happened. As of 2023, there are 27 Coyote Ugly Bars worldwide, including the one next to Lip. <laughs> <laughs> and Kevin Smith actually contributed to a rewrite of the script. Interesting. And even that couldn't save it. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Mary. So uh, there's definitely a lot to unpack there. I think the first thing that I want to uh, pick up on is it definitely, I think that's the other thing about this, this bar, which I think definitely had potential, but they don't utilize a lot is because they've had to rebuild it so that uh, you're no longer having the heads man. It definitely felt larger than I think a lot of other bars. It, I'm not sure about you, David, but it gave me like an old Porter's vibe in that sense. Just how like sort of tall it ends up being. Mm, yeah, yeah. And I think the, well, that's uh, funny enough. It reminded me a lot of that film I worked on, like Life's a Drag in some ways. Yeah. It's a cool, like the bar film, you know, and kind of like encapsulating the vibe of which was filmed in Porter's. So yeah, yeah. maybe that sort of was also in my head. Yeah. Also, I'm surprised that Tyra Banks of all people was calling for the extension of the film, considering that of the like coyote, she's the most inconsequential because she's mm. the one that left. I wish that again they had more of her, like, you know, she's gone on to do law and stuff. It's like, let's talk about that and let's see that, you know, it's kind of like rather than just be like, let's get her back up on the bar and you Yeah, because surely she's the comparison she's meant to be the comparison character for what Violet is going through, right? She is the person who was a coyote and was like, Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave now. And it's very much should be the archetypal of this is a vec you can just show that you can leave although not really because you come back and even when you try to be a paying customer you're like get on the bar and work and also the fact that the poster has her on there makes it seem like they're going to be like some big group but she's not a part of the coyotes really yeah she was more consequential in hannah montana <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I liked that people wanted more john goodman i think that that says a lot about the things that were lacking in this film the question is what scenes of him were added, right? Because it's either it's either going to be he was going to be a complete grunt for all of this and they add in the end scene to which he gets fat shamed effectively or it's going to be they had that scene in and they were like, they just added more scenes of him being just really miserable, like him on the phone and just being like, oh yeah, I'm eating this, uh, this rice bento box, whatever mm -hmm. it is. And he's just eating like a KFC bucket. That could easily be added. I also felt as if maybe the getting hit by a car was maybe shoehorned in or something like that. Because again, like, ooh, and, to, and you know, raise up the drama. And that's where you could have the whole Which thing about be the mother. Odd, stuff. Because if, if that wasn't the original catalyst for his, like, mm. coming around a character, what would have the film done instead? Yeah, just, he just turned, I don't he just think comes the film around. needs explanations. <laughs> he just got home and really, like, looked at those socks and thought, I best do something about this. <laughs> it's just like, damn it, I need a woman's touch around here now. What have I done? <laughs> yeah. I have one of two options. I'll pursue both of them. Right. So uh, we now go to the final bit of the discussion, uh, which is the movie vault. So for anyone new to the podcast, we like to think of this as a time capsule of memorable movies for someone to dig up in the future. So should today's film gain the honor of a place in our movie vault and be remembered for all time? Liv couldn't remember it after two hours, so I'm guessing for all time, possibly not. Liv, what do you think? I, I think what you've just said is it. Even if it should be remembered for all time, it won't be and therefore doesn't deserve it. It is, oh, no, it's everything that's good about it is better and more memorable in something else. And everything is that's bad about it is worse and more laughable and entertaining in something else. It doesn't even belong in the bin. It belongs in the side of the road, just whistling away in the wind. <laughs> wow. Okay. 
Um, I'm going to go to Craig next just to know kind of like... No, no, no. I think you need to leave me to last because okay. I'm preparing a tribute for Paul. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I was ready to come in and try to like be like, okay, you know, what would be if I was to defend this to try and help Paul to get it in there? And I think what my justification would have been is that this is like a very mediocre film and I can see kind of the appeal of a lot of the characters and the moments it has and some of the humor and the kind of naughtiness of it and the fact that we've all said that we know the song we know the film from the bars etc and we know it from like the repeats and stuff I think it's kind of indicative of that film which is a very Sunday on in the background kind of film and it doesn't do any harm so maybe I think that it's kind of like a, a better of the terrible you know like not great films it kind of maybe could represent that i don't know i may be pulling the straws i'm just trying to be the one who's i'm not just trying to pay a little bit of attention here <laughs> i'm getting a lot of uh very frustrated looks from uh mary i i don't know maybe it's kind of like the fact to me sometimes we say should its legacy be the only thing it goes in for and again i always bring up avatar and it's like oh should it be there for like it being like this great 3d film and stuff like that and it's kind of like, well, it failed as a story, so ultimately, no. And is that something you want to celebrate ultimately in the end anyway? But I do think that, one, I'm almost tempted to put it in just so Liv remembers it. <laughs> Maybe every episode we just go, by the way, this is in there. And then Liv's like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that film. Uh, but also, I'm like, I don't know, do you put it in there because of the ITV2 legacy? It's on there so much. It's just like, give it credit for that. <laughs> That's all I could come up with. Mary, why shouldn't it go in? <laughs> Because I, it, it's as Liv said, it's so, so forgettable. And if you want to watch a bad early 2000s movies, I can give you, you know, a shopping list of other films that you should watch instead. And actually having watched it now with my big girl eyes or whatever you want to call it, it's just, it's so exploitative and not even in a way that's remotely like funny or clever or tongue in cheek. It's just, just a really bad, forgettable film with instantly forgettable characters, really terrible dialogue, and a couple of good songs, which is not redeeming enough. So it, it's definitely not going in the vault for me. So what you're saying is you want to go back to Showgirls and put that back, that in. <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine if that was like, that's like some weird Sophie's Choice where you can save Showgirls or you can save Coyote Ugly. I'd have to say, like, gun to my head, I would take Showgirls over that. <laughs> You know, that meme with, I mentioned it the other day with the gun and then another person pointing the gun and another person pointing the gun. It'd be like some weird Mary's journey on the podcast of Showgirls Coyote Ugly. <laughs> Craig, what's your thoughts? I just have a message to Paul. Um, it seems that the outcome of this is that Coyote Ugly will not be going in the vault. Um, I agree with everything that's been said. However, I, I do... Would, do what it known. We would love you to come back. Uh, I hope you can forgive us. But in the event that you uphold your boycott of the show because it's not going in, uh, I do just have this little tribute for you. Did I disappoint you or let you down? Should I be feeling guilty or let the judges frown? Cause I saw the end before we'd begun Yes, I saw you were blind and I knew I had won you touched my heart, you touched my soul, changed my life and all my goals. And love is blind, and I knew when my heart was blinded by you. Goodbye, my lover. Goodbye, my friend. You have been the one. You have been the one for me. Goodbye, my lover. Goodbye, my friend. You have been the one. You have been the one for me. Okay, end game time. Um. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, 
Uh, Paul, I tried, you know, I, I, I tried to come up with what was some form of argument, um, but yeah, and I tried to defend certain elements, but like we said, it it's hard to justify some of the kind of cookie cutter elements of this and the predictability. It definitely has its legacy and it definitely has its fame for whatever reason, nostalgia, bars, etc. But that's where it shall live. <laughs> I do just be. think at some point in the future, we need an episode where it is Mary and Paul just on like films of this nature just so we can just actual head to head. It's yes. Like, what on earth are you thinking sort of thing? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, unfortunately, Coyote Ugly doesn't go into the movie vault. Do you agree, Paul? We know you don't. We're sorry. Uh, maybe in the recap, the, the end of year, we'll have a bit more thoughts and uh, feelings from some of... Uh, it sounds like you're genuinely guests. crying, David. <laughs> <laughs> it was the song that really choked me up. But uh, yeah, maybe we'll have some more thoughts and uh, recaps at the end of the year. But yeah. For now, doesn't go in. Let us know what you think. Do you agree with Paul? Do you agree with Mary and the rest of us? <laughs> Let us know. But yeah, over to this week's Endgame. We're in the Endgame now. Oh, it's so okay, Endgame time. Let's get down to business. Just to be clear, that's the end, uh, end game name, not like a, an inspirational thing. Uh, it's actually called Let's Get Down to Business. So we've obviously discussed the fact that uh, there's a chain of Coyote Ugly Bars. And it got me thinking, I would like to see more films converted into everyday sort of businesses. And that's what I'm going to get you guys doing. Because we thought, you know, we've given you enough of the trivia. We've given you enough of the, uh, of like the hard film stuff. Let's give you the creative uh, license. Um, and by that, we knew that Liv was coming on. And we wanted to see if we got any more flying slabs of pork. Um <laughs> So what's going to happen is we have two separate spinning wheels. One will have a genre of film. Whatever genre of film comes up for you as an individual. So we are going to spin the wheel twice. So uh, Mary and Liv should have your own separate genre. So you can choose any film that you want from within that genre. However, we have a second wheel which has a type of business and this is non-negotiable. So whatever type of business that you individually get, that is what you have to make make of for your film. So we're just gonna do a quick experiment with this. So let me just set up the zoom. What will happen every round is that basically David will be judging. David each round has a maximum of 100,000 pounds that he wants to invest in the business. However, this needs to be split between the two of you. So say that he prefers one over the other, he might go say like 90,000 to one of you, 10,000 to another. Uh, 75,000, 25,000, or even he might just split it down the middle, or he could just be like, I want to give all of the money to this one business idea. I want to make that business idea work. This is very much to the whim of what David wants. So very much focus your pitches along those lines. Okay, so. And I think based off my thoughts and opinions in previous episodes, I think uh, everyone here would agree I should never be given a hundred thousand pounds. <laughs> the genres you can have are comedy, action, horror, romantic comedy, drama, thriller, animated, biopic, musical, or sci-fi. And the businesses that you'll be trying to create are a chemist, a butcher, a florist, a baker, a boutique, hardware store, a toy store, beauty salon, green grocer, and a bookstore. So before we get into that, we do need to know what it is that we will be playing for. So, all of us have a film suggestion for today um, that we would like to have done. So, the question is, let's hear a little bit about what we've got going forward. So, uh, let's start with the one that I'm most scared of, which will be Liv's. You have no reason to be scared, Craig. I was warned. I behave mostly in this podcast now. Mostly, yeah. Um, okay, so, Coyote Ugly, right? It was a film where, at its core, Piper Perabo plays an allegedly super duper innocent girly who double takes a love interest from a distance at the start of the film, having no idea what she's about to get into, but it's all right because she's about to get into something pretty low stakes, right? The film I am suggesting is from 2005 and it perfectly fits this description as well. 
but it's actually good. So that's my pitch. <laughs> okay, wonderful. So we've got effectively the same film, but better from Liv. Let's go to Mary. I just love how there's still Coyote Ugly Bird in yeah. this bit when we've gone past the Coyote Ugly now and then Liv is still like, it's actually good. Yeah. All right, let's go to Mary next. Okay, so because Coyote Ugly is based on an article... I have decided to go for a 1975 film directed by Sidney Lumi, which is also based on a Life magazine article called The Boys in the Bank. And that should tell you that this film is about three amateur bank robbers and it's got a pretty stacked cast. Okay, excellent. Um, So we've effectively got a heist film from 1975. Uh, Let's go to David's film next. Uh, So I've gone, I think, in a very different... uh, approach for my film. Um, I was thinking about what does this remind me of and what do I think of when I think of Coyote Ugly and what could be very different. And I couldn't help but just be drawn to the name. Um, And immediately I thought of probably one of the greatest tragedies in Hollywood in recent years of a certain character who is just being completely trashed and dragged through the mud by the Hollywood system. And I think it's an absolute travesty that that has happened to them and they they don't get the spotlight. So I want to give them the spotlight again by talking about this film, by talking about this franchise in which they appear alongside other, you know, beloved actors. Like in this film, we have John Goodman. Here we have Brendan Fraser and a cast of characters which are very much well known. Uh, This film is from 2003. I know exactly what film you've chosen. (laughs) Okay, so we've got uh, we've got David's effective revival film from 2003. Finally, we have my film, which is from 2002. So I've identified the big issue with regards to the sort of what we've described as the walk down showbiz avenue effect that we've had. So they started with Showgirls and has gone on for like a number of episodes after that. Even some of the films that we've had this year, I think, have had this issue. Um, what it is... It comes down to, like, people telling other people that they should hate being in their industry. And there's often a lot of sort of animosity with regards to people wanting to be in a showbiz industry, but necessarily hating it. And often in many situations feeling like there's no value that they can necessarily get out of this. Um, And I feel that that needs to basically be broken. So the film that I have isn't technically like a, you know, somebody becoming a, a, like a star at the end. It is very much them using an A a form of entertainment to actively try and better the, uh, better their own life and actively embrace sort of this art form. Also note, this one is about a guy. So any sort of like f- previous themes of like exploitation just doesn't exist or certainly doesn't exist to the same, uh, to the same extent. Similarities. This film does spawn a very culturally prominent song. Uh, one that like many crowds still sing today whenever they hear it. Um, it's very emotional, very driven, uh, very, very relatable to a lot of people's hearts. Um, it has a lot of scenes in which the fans are being sort of like worked in the same way as in Coyote Ugly, but this time it's a lot more, it's a lot more interesting and actually a lot more engaging. But also the 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 actor in question for this film has recently come back in a big way, but has also come back specifically to retire one of his most prominent characters. So I felt it's fitting to actually talk about his one and only film. Uh, around this time frame, I think it would be really, really uh, a good opportunity to do that. So that is my film pitch uh, for 2002. So the question is, which of those four will be chosen? That can only be decided once we actually know who the winner between Mary and Liv is, and then also what it is that they'll be going for. So are you both ready for the first round? Sure. Cool. So... Let's get the wheels back up. So, uh, David, who would you like to have the um, the details first? I think Mary, because this is the first time she would have done this style of endgame. All right. So, Mary, how many t- how many times would you like me to click? Because this wheel does actually oh, actually spin um, until I stop clicking. Just the four. Okay. So one, two, three, four. Your genre is sci-fi oh. Oh. almost musical <laughs> okay so your genre is sci-fi okay y- your type of business is a sci-fi butcher please 
<laughs> so Mary will be creating a sci-fi themed butcher's shop. So again, choose any sci-fi film that you want to relate this uh, to relate to it. So Liv, how many clicks would you like of the genre wheel? Sixty-nine. Wow. <laughs> Jesus. Okay, right. <laughs> one. Two, and Liv said she was going to behave. Five, six, seven, <laughs> eight. No. Oh no! It only takes the one click. Apparently, I was just wrong. Hello. Oh, it's just air. Oh, I broke it. We will spin that. I will spin it again so that it's not the same genre. Oh, I'd love to have sci-fi butcher. Well, no, no, no. Like, you can have sci-fi in another round potentially, but right again. Yep. You are going to be giving us an action film and your business, uh, an action film based toy store. Potentially okay. there's some that already exist. Like that. Yeah. All right. So what we'll do now is we're going to give you a minute to think of your ideas and then we'll hear your pitches. So hopefully you've already got some ideas brewing, but off you go. A few moments later. So Mary, as you had yours first, talk us through your business idea. I really hope that I've got the gist of this properly. <laughs> Otherwise, this is just going to be a minute of me talking nonsense. So okay. for the sci-fi butcher, the business idea is back to the butcher. So uh... Doc in his white coat serving behind the counter like butchers do. If you don't order quickly enough, you're out of time. And Marty skates customer deliveries eh, to their home. And if you're feeling really special, you can get DeLorean shaped Christmas hams. <laughs> yeah first of all i think we've we've got to establish fantastic fantastic pun name that's exactly the sort of thing that, <laughs> yes that we're looking for um all right wonderful uh david do you have any like little feedback that you would give at this point without indicating how much money you're going to be investing? um i just think like butcher is one of the most difficult ones so i think kudos for finding something to link to a butcher which wasn't horror you know like horror based or anything yeah. like that as well Wonderful. So now we go to Liv. So you have your action-based toy store. Okay, so my action-based toy store is going to be called Rambo Land. And on the door, uh, you pay a large fee, uh, sign some risk assessments, some waivers, and a quick insurance paper. And basically, you go in the store and... Once you've paid this lump fee, um, lump fee, you can take as many toys as you like as possible, and you can keep any that you make it out with. Now, there are indeed things that can prevent you from making it out, such as hunks with, um, let's say, a bit stronger than LARPing weapons, uh, a lot of hunks with weapons, um, people with quad bikes trying to ram you out of the store, um, a load of people with boxing gloves and uh, anything slightly violent enough to make this entertaining for anyone into it, but not so violent that we get sued. Uh, so yeah, that's Rambo land. <laughs> it's so the parents can have fun as well as the kids during toy shopping season. So let me get this straight. So <laughs> what I love the premise of this building is kids are already excited going to a toy store anyway. But what you want to do is keep them there while their parents are doing boring admin. And so then presumably they're so like ham ramped up by the time that they get in, they'll just go berserk. And then they could easily just be like punched out by like some some like store tough who's like mad maxing it effectively on just like quad bikes. It's a very big store. I've decided it's three stories. Um, <laughs> and it's got n and no elevators, but it's got no stairs. No either. elevators? It's, got, <laughs> it's just got really big ramps for the quad bikes. Oh, that's what we love. Uh, <laughs> fully accessible stores. I think I love the idea of uh, you go in and can have as much as you want, like on the basis of like whatever you can make it out with. It's very much a Black Friday kind of approach to retail. All right. So now that we've had those pitches, uh, David... How much money are you going to be giving to each of our participants in order to make their stores a reality? Can I just check what lives the name of that was? Again? Oh, the Rambo Land. Rambo Land. <laughs> so I think obviously something I mentioned, which was, you know, in fairness, towards the tail end of uh, the minute was, you know, <laughs> do I think this would be investable in terms of I would get money back or I could see people spending money in this. So I think Rambo Land is a more difficult one to say that like, I think that that would be viable as Liv did say about like, 
potentially being sued. Um, so I think the Although back- they have to sign the waivers. So well, <laughs> yeah, there is that. But whether this would attract people, I don't know. So I think Back to the Butcher is definitely a more appealing kind of like has mass mass appeal. But I did also like the mary had you know there's a few references in there i think again that's how you sort of like if you want to capture those back to the future fans you know it's the hams and the like you know you're out of time and and those kind of references so i think i would put 70 into back to the butcher and 30 into rambo land because i think it's a fun idea but i would go lower just because it's such a big risk okay fantastic so by the end uh at the end of round one mary is up up live by forty thousand. Uh, forty thousand pounds fantastic so are we ready for the next set of businesses yes okay we'll start with live this time because of uh just to make sure that adequate time is given to each of you so your genre and it's musical oh god okay so you have to choose a musical to create this store out of and that store is a bookstore, a musical bookstore. Okay. Again, probably some films that spring That's to my like mind. But... Things I'm gutted. Yeah. Okay. So... I was going to sing a song there, but I was like, oh, I don't want to give any. Yeah, ideas. like let's not. I mean, there's one that screams out to me, but yeah. All right. So we have Liv's musical bookstore. Just to clarify as well, this should be a movie musical, right? Mm, so, yes, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, as much as I would love a Book of Mormon based <laughs> bookstore, um, not a movie. Right. So, Mary, are you ready? Yes. So, your genre. Oh, it's the rom com. Oh, Mary's favorite genre. <laughs> so, you have to make a rom com into. <laughs> I mean, there's one that if it if it doesn't come up, then actually no, I don't know. I wonder what would be Mary's least favorite store, hard hardware store maybe. Like oh, you a... have a bookstore as well. Oh, okay. oh, and actually, yeah, no, I'll leave it at the bookstore. I think that's yeah. fair. It's a shame the florist didn't come up. That's yeah. like the obvious one. Yes, yeah. All right, so we've both, uh, so we've got them both coming up with bookstores, one for a musical, one for a rom com. All of these things, I think, scream very David. <laughs> All right, so your time starts now. Several bad puns later. And that is the minute. So, Liv. Okay, this is niche. I uh, wasn't very uh, out of the box with this, but my uh, musical bookstore is going to be called Beautiful, Beautiful Books. <laughs> and uh, basically, it is an 18-plus bookshop uh, where people can meet the loves of their lives. Um and in doing so, they effectively choose a book off the shelf. Someone else will choose the same book off the shelf. They go to the table and music themed around that book will play. Uh, so, for example, if I were to hypothetically uh, choose Beauty and the Beast, yeah. our date would have that playing in the background the whole time. The only niche catch is that all the men are rich and hairy. <laughs> That's the prerequisite of going. <laughs> oh, because oh. yeah, my instant thought for this was obviously Beauty and the Beast. I just didn't. So to, to be clear, that's the musical you are just basing this off of, or oh yeah, okay, cool. Um, but uh, you can pick any book, and if if I pick, for example. I don't know. I I pick uh, Les Miserables. No one else picks it. I just have to sit there listening to the music by myself with that book. But that's fine because I can just read it. <laughs> okay. I don't need someone else to pick the book. I can just read it. To be fair, I think there is something quite fitting about you reading Les Miserables in a, in a book store and just having, look down, look down, don't look them in the eye. <laughs> Being incredibly antithetical to a dating-based bookstore. But but we're also saying that if somebody did pick up The Sound of Music and somebody else picked up The Sound of Music, the man who likes Sound of Music would be big and hairy. <laughs> yeah, because what you're basically saying is that you have to be one of three things. Oh, no, like, okay, so I'm not going to go as much <laughs> into the gender spectrum here, but effectively you need to be one of these three presenting <laughs> things. You either have to just be a woman... You either just have to be a blatantly not straight man or you have to be a rich but hairy man. What you're basically saying, Liv, is I am not welcome. <laughs> no, you can 
doesn't work there, Craig. <laughs> oh, fantastic. I'm lit literally feeding into that like element of I guide others to a treasure I cannot possess. <laughs> right, David, do you have any feedback? Uh, no, it was just the, the clarification about um, the, the men who go there. So that's, yeah, that's yeah. enough. Okay, wonderful. And now we have Mary with the uh, rom-com based bookstore. Okay, so my bookstore is called Books, actually. And nice. as you go in, you'll get met by a, a different sales assistant. So, for example, if you wanted to read political history, you would get met by Hugh Grant. Or if you wanted a heartbreak novel, you would get met by Emma Thompson. You would get your travel tips from Chris Marshall. Or you could find the Learn a Language section with, with Colin Firth. Uh, and Joanne Page would be on hand to give you uh, the Kama Sutra. So it's a very themed bookstore. And you just have to know precisely what you're looking for in terms of genre. And somebody can come along and help you find the book that you need. <laughs> and just to be clear, unlike Liv's store, you're not promising that people find the loves of their lives in the store. <laughs> no, 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 definitely okay. not. Just a good book, which in fairness, I think most people would take. Okay, because for, for a split second, I've, I had that inclination. I thought this was just a weird escort service. Um, <laughs> no, no, this is uh, definitely about books, I promise. <laughs> Okay, cool. So, David, uh, what's your feeling on... This? Again, it's, it's another question, just to know a bit more. So, you're obviously hindering a lot on where the actors or characters are. So, a big part of that film is Rowan Atkinson with his little, you know, rapping of the gift. Where's Rowan Atkinson in, in this? Well, obviously, he is behind the till wrapping your books once you've chosen ah. your purchase. <laughs> I just give you the answer. <laughs> <laughs> And just a, are these are these like the actual actors or are they people playing like the characters? Oh no, we'll get the actual actress thing for sure. Cool. So you're going to resurrect Alan Rickman from the dead. I didn't Who see he had that? a I didn't see he had a book section because he broke my heart. Oh, oh right, film, I so see. So it's only okay. So it's only the people you said. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, in that case, we'll now pass over to David to uh, make his funding offers. Yes. Um. I think. Well, the fact that they're both bookstores does make it very appealing just from a business point of view. You know, book, books are very, having a boom at the moment, you know, book talk, etc. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, because so, they actively chose to do bookstores yeah. of all the other types of stores. <laughs> but I think you have tapped into the the appeal of books there, of, you know, going in and, you know, choosing your book and everything like that. There's nothing too chaotic, which is also helped by the genre um, I, I can kind of envision both as well. I think with the previous one, I couldn't visualize the Rambo land quite as much, um, but I can kind of imagine this kind of, whether it's just through the image of Liv just sat alone drink, reading Les Miserables, but I can imagine this room of uh, hairy rich men and, uh, you know, ladies picking out books and it all being quite elaborate. Um, but I can also equally imagine, again, all these actors and people, you know, going there to be helped. So I'm very torn. So therefore I'll go 50-50. Okay, split down the middle. So that's another £50,000 to both uh, to both of your businesses. Um, hopefully that's enough money to actually buy the rights for the actors to mm -hmm. give up their lucrative careers to come and work at this bookstop. I mean, they do cameo, so, you know, yes. some of them. All right. So we now move on to the final round. So going into this, I believe the the scores are Liv is currently on eighty thousand pounds, with Mary on a hundred and twenty thousand pounds. So it's still very much everything to play for. So are we are we ready? Starting this time yes. with Mary. Are you ready for your genre? Can't wait. And your genre for the final business is drama. Oh, oh, okay. Going to land on romantic comedy again. Though. I would, I would have actively respawn this one. So you've got a drama, okay, which that you have to convert into a beauty salon. Oh, <laughs> excellent, excellent. <laughs> okay, and then live your genre as determined by the wheel. Do we? Oh, you got sci-fi back. Oh. So you do get your sci-fi wish, but you're going to have to make a business. Oh, no. A sci-fi boutique. <laughs> that should be fun. <laughs> yeah. Have fun selling old stuff from a galaxy far, far away. All right. So we've got Mary with uh, the uh, drama beauty salon yes that's him. and you have live with the sci-fi boutique 
Your time starts now. One million zillion jillion dillion cotillion times later. And that is the minute up. So we'll start with we'll start with Mary. Okay, so my drama themed beauty salon is called Curl Up and Die. BYE. And this is based on the premise that in the 90s there was a lot of like dramas like malice and sleeping with the enemy and single white female and all that sort of thing so basically you come in you sign a waiver and then some absolute psychopath who is probably quite attractive and charming does your hair and your makeup but there's like a 50 50 chance they'll end up stalking you afterwards (laughs) oh (laughs) oh god okay but they'll do your hair and makeup really well so that's like (laughs) Okay. And, and just to be clear as well, so presumably you would want this to be a repeat business. That means that people are playing like the 50-50 odds over and over again. Yeah, well, that's kind of part of the thrill. And also, like, if they don't stalk you, I assume after a while you'd be like, why is this typically attractive man not following me home? I'm going to go and get my hair cut again so that he might start stalking me, rearranging my towels in the bathroom and making me freak out a little bit. Okay, but what happens if you have, like, multiple people from the same place stalking you? Or, but if you have the same person cut your hair each time, you are, you know... Yeah, it works like a normal salon. You have, like, an assigned stylist. So it's not like you would go to different stylists every time. It works like a conventional salon. So there is that... The it's stalkers happy because they it. get to see yeah. you and yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, and they also have a legal legal defense. It's like your honor, if there was a problem with the stalking, they wouldn't have come back to the store so many times. And think about it, they literally have access to your hair because they're like cutting. They could have like little bags that they could take home, and it could be like this was Tuesday when I cut Liv's hair. This was Thursday when I cut <laughs> Liv's hair. Do you see? What? It what works perfectly. It's, it's so weird. This like this is in favor of the stalker. Not the I was gonna stalker. I was gonna say from Mary, who's been a big like proponent in the past of like you know like. Like not exploiting individuals, literally going, I'm <laughs> yeah. going to set up a business where people <laughs> will just stalk you. Can I just say, I just really love, like, a, a, the minute you heard drama, I was like, oh my God, I love a 90s drama. And it is things like Sleeping with the Enemy and Malice that immediately came to my head. It's those kind of films I absolutely love. So I was like, this is perfect. You get hair clippings, like, as part of the job. Let's just be happy that there wasn't a frenzy based, you know, one. So if you sit in the chair and a tie goes around your neck, you instantly are like, I get out. Oh my God. And then now when you're cutting your hair and they're like, oh, how does it look? And they'd be like, lovely, lovely. Hold up the mirror at the back. Oh, damn. I'm getting terrified now. So we're now going to move on to Liv's pitch. So actually, no, we do need to have like David's feedback first. Uh, well, yeah, I think that it's it's definitely I, I have to think about the optics of uh, the, the the cash flow situation of, yeah, whether this is in favor of the stalker or the customer, how much I, I don't know. I, I can see I can see how it's kind of like a I don't know. Is it would it be a guilty pleasure like tapping into the kind of like I feel like you know, both my previous unknown. suggestions were quite serious and Liv is obviously mm. having a whale of a time. So I just thought, <laughs> yes, ah, well. yeah, I, I sense that too. <laughs> this goes psycho. <laughs> OK. All right, so let's go to let's go to live now. So let's talk about your sci-fi boutique. I think mine actually might be mundane compared to Mary's. <laughs> um, I kind of had a feeling, but yeah, go on. But also, I I just want you to know, I think Mary's is the rehabilitation program that this state needs. Uh, <laughs> but, but anyway. Uh, so my sci-fi boutique is um, probably going to be the biggest money maker that you'll ever have heard of. So it's going to be what we in the business like to call a scam. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to take all the common tropes that people tend to buy into with um, uh, through like sci-fi media and major sci-fi movies and franchises, and we're going to take all the ones that um correlate with those the most believable in conspiracy theories about time travel and those kinds of things and we're going to try and disseminate leaflets from our stall and disseminate information about this but also we're going to play into those tropes within the store itself and what we're going to sell is random tat and retro (laughs) stuff we've gotten from charity shops but we are going to tell everyone it's from the future (laughs) we're going to charge a lot of money for it Okay, and which specific film is this related to? Uh, let me pick a sci-fi time travel film. You know what? Let's go with... See, I was thinking about this extensively and my brain was hoping I'd come up with something better than uh, Back to the Future, but I feel like that is 
the go-to of most believable kind of sci-fi. No, script. everything everywhere all at once. That's got random yeah. tap okay. in it and it's got the multiverse that's got time in it. Yeah, that's what we're going. Okay, so David, uh, let's 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 talk about this business. Mm. Well, I think investing in a scam is certainly one way to go. Um, and I think, yeah, I think I was, I think everything everywhere all at once sells it a lot more, you know, something quite recent and again, like multiverse and, you, you know, sell like, you could literally just stitch sausages onto like, mm. onto like yellow gloves. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. So, um, yeah. What you need to understand is all we have to tell people that the film is based on reality and that we don't want people to know because the government's trying to keep us quiet. And then, like, genuinely, we can say we inspired the film. It's kind of like a pyramid scheme, but okay. <laughs> Some quasi interdimensional <laughs> pyramid scheme. All right, so David, you do now need to make your final decision. Well, I think much to Mary's point, I think that, you know, in which Liv has gone very crazy and then you know, has continued that trend to a degree. And then Mary has jumped on that. I think that then maybe lowers the investment a lot more from the previous ones. So I don't think as much money can be put into these businesses just for the moral uh, complications that might arise. But it doesn't mean I'm not going to invest. Um, See, so yeah, I think the Mary's has the element of like, some sort of guilty pleasure some sort of like weird twisted allure to it the people might go to it um but then you can't deny the you know nerds love their tats so <laughs> um the fact that i think is strong as well that you said like you know but it's from the future and almost the fact that people would say no that's bullshit would then add to maybe like the kind of tommy was so effective just being like no no it was always intended you know like they know that and you know, this kind of element but i think I think that Mary's would need the most investment and has, I can see, I think there's maybe an untapped audience there. So I think that maybe Liv's audience already exists. So I'm going to go 5,000 for Mary and 2,000 for Liv. Oh, wow. So you are just, you are just taking 97,000 pounds for yourself. <laughs> yes. I said they're both dangerous ideas, okay. you know, so I, I, I can't fully commit. Okay. This is not quite the outcome I imagined, but... <laughs> Uh, that does mean with a final score of Liv having eighty eighty five thousand pounds. Is that right? Oh no, you're giving more to you're giving more to Mary. Yeah, so okay, Mary sorry. has so, seventy fifty five. Uh, so Liv in that has case, had yeah, so, fifty two. So Liv has a score of eighty two thousand pounds, but the winner is Mary with one hundred and twenty five thousand pounds worth of investment. <laughs> unbelievable i don't think i've ever won a quiz on here i'm so excited but you still haven't this wasn't a quiz <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Harsh>. <laughs> sorry no, no you've won an end game it's so an end yes. game yeah i think oh, you won was... against me but <laughs> that, that, that was yeah. like the saddest thing ever you're like oh you've won an end game <laughs> <laughs> no you did win against me once but i'm not sure if that's much of an accomplishment unfortunately now to be fair i mean sometimes the creative challenges are a lot harder to win than like trivia based ones and right? lives because... them well in the past because because here's the thing, anyone can just happen to remember things, but actually having to create the content for the basis of the game itself is a different kettle of fish in and of itself. And the last time we did this, ironically, Sam Summers, we asked somebody to make like an animated fun film. Yeah. And he suggested a film in which... A oh, he created Raccoon 2, yeah, which ended uh, up being in, in every... everywhere, every all, all at once. Yeah. So who knows, maybe this psycho beauty salon will appear in some way or form now that we've yeah it'll be we'll like it into put it out there into the ether yes. it'll be like an fx drama like the bear so <laughs> yeah. all right but of course mary so you are the winner which means that you do have the choice of which film that we discuss next time so do you want to go with your choice do you want to go with live choice or do you want to go with either of our choices um i mean i won't lie i'm kind of tempted to buy Liv's choice because i just know it's going to be chaos but I think to take things in a different direction, to know that it's not going to repeat your pattern, I'm going to stick with my own. You are going to stick with your own. Okay. Yeah. So in that case, uh, tell us a little bit more about the film and then fundamentally which film it is. So this film has quite a cool uh, poster and the poster is all sort of different uh, times in a clock. And it says the robbery should have taken 10 minutes is the start of it. Um, it has, as I say, really big stars in it, um, including two big stars of The Godfather, and it also won an Oscar, I believe. So the film is... Da, 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 da. 
Dog Day Afternoon. Dog Day Afternoon. Yeah. That's interesting because like, I've heard the name a lot. I didn't realize it's about bank robbery. Cool. Okay. So yeah, and that's good as well that, like I said, we've gone back in time after being stuck in the ni- 90s and 2000s for a while as well. So that mm. that's good. So okay. Dog Day Afternoon. And uh, I think as well, because that's why I found funny is if Liv had one and chose hers, it's kind of like she is down for the next episode as well. So you, can, you, can, <laughs> you couldn't have chosen something to punish Craig because you would have been punishing yourself as well. I mean, I was going to choose Mary's if I won the end game just because I like films where people steal things. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair. As demonstrated by the fact your last business is a scam. Is it is an MLM, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. I'm not very good at making businesses or thinking through end games beyond the first five seconds you give us. So <laughs> <laughs> it's still entertaining. That's, honestly, that else. felt like more pressure than like being on like University Challenge or something. I was taking that very, <laughs> very seriously until I realized on the second round that Liv was not. And I was like, okay, yeah, I need to up my game. <laughs> Oh, your first one was refined. If I had money, I would invest. Yes. (laughs) So, David, where can we watch Dog Day Afternoon? Uh, So, at the moment, uh, it's mainly for rental. You can get it on places like Apple TV, Amazon, Sky Store, and YouTube. Uh, But you can also, uh, I assume, uh, find it on physical media out there, potentially Blu-ray or DVD. Um, Maybe even a VHS. You never know if you still got one lying around. So, yeah, go check out Dog Day Afternoon so you can watch along with us uh, and follow our chain of movies and see where that goes. And, yeah, definitely taking us away from a lot of the themes we've had, especially, again, with uh, Disney and the like uh, most recently. So thank you, Mary. And uh, thank you both for joining us and discussing... What film are we discussing again? Sorry, Liv. What? I, I can't remember what film. <laughs> uh, something to do with um, Coyote. <laughs> oh. I, I thought we were talking about Angry Beaver, the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Paul. Please stick with us, Paul. Uh, but yeah, it's been quite the conversation, trying to defend certain elements of this, talking about the legacy of it, um, and yeah, just uh, going through all the, the crazy, you know, typical stereotypes that you had at that time uh, in 2000 so yeah for uh, all socials and where to catch people you can catch those down in the description i'll be linking uh, mary and lives or letterboxes or twitters etc uh, craig anything lastly from yourself i find it fitting that we haven't actually made this link but we are going from coyotes to dogs um yeah true both true. animals which very by their very nature can't fight the moonlight <laughs> And I'll try to fight not putting that in the end credit music as it's already in our head. So thank you, everyone. Let us know what you think of next time's film and today's. uh, And we'll catch you in the next one. Bye-bye. To keep up with the latest episodes of Well Good Movies, you can listen to us on all your usual podcast outlets, including Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube, and more. Don't forget to follow us, subscribe and rate us where you can to keep our podcast growing. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at WellGoodMovies to keep up with the latest news and highlights from all our episodes, as well as tell us what movies you want to be discussed in the future. So what are you waiting for? Go check out the film we'll be discussing in next time's episode. like you were mad at me i'm sorry that I, th- I thought you were mad at me because you left like you were mad that's why i thought you was mad i kept saying it's your birthday and you were leaving well, i thought you was mad <laughs>